All right, so welcome everyone. Good evening, good afternoon, and good morning, according to where you are and what time is in your place. Um, and welcome to, or we are going to spend these two hours on the edge, at the edge of Cartesianism, discussing about Pierre Sylvain Regis. We are online on YouTube, so if you feel like Claudia has shared uh, the link that you can distribute further on Facebook or other social media. They're going to have three papers tonight and they're going to be delivered one after another with questions and answers at the end. Our first speaker is Aaron Spink and the title of his talk is Pierre Sylvain Regis, Empiricist Soul. Aaron, you have the floor. Thank you. Let me just share my screen here. See what we can do. I look all right. Okay. So, um, because I'm the first talk, I wanted to give like a little bit of an intellectual biography of Regi, um, just in case people weren't super familiar with his work. Um, some of it will play. Uh, into later parts of my talk. But eventually we're gonna to get to my talk, which will be uh, talking about Regis empiricism and how it matches up with uh, Cartesian mind-body dualism and the arguments for it. So starting off with Regis, uh, who he was, and why, why you should care, I guess you don't have to, but I think he's pretty neat. Uh, he started off like so many uh, scholars started off in the 17th century, he has sort of the standard Cartesian origin story, where he started off learning scholastic philosophy, and then he was exposed to Cartesian philosophy, likely through um, the Conference of Jacques Rojo and his weekly Wednesday Cartesian meetings. And after that, he had this um, revelatory moment where he abandons everything that came before and accepts the new Cartesian philosophy, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, sort of standard fare for the, for the day. Um, he gets really inspired by Jacques Rouault and his weekly meetings where he would demonstrate Cartesian principles with simple experiments, et cetera. And he goes out to sort of like pros proselytize, I suppose. So in 1665, he moves to Toulouse um, to co conduct his own uh, rather popular Cartesian conference. Um, and they're actually super popular. He ends up picking up a salary from the city. Um, they're widely attended. And as I think was fairly common for some of these conferences, um, they were attended by women as well. Uh, we get a lot of this information from Fontenelle's obituary, I guess we could call it that, or eulogy for uh, Regis, where he talks about the female population there. And he actually says there is one particularly well, um, well-versed well woman who, although it's a little ambiguous in the text, I think she defended a Cartesian thesis. Um, after Toulouse, he continues through the south of France, um, starting these weekly meetings and teaching Cartesianism. So he moves to Agamort and then Montpellier. But finally in 1680, he's able to return to Paris and he returns um, to Paris mostly um, to try to publish his uh, textbook, which we'll talk about in a little bit. But as soon as he starts uh, up his conferences again in Paris, he's quickly asked to stop by the archbishop. And he's also runs into other troubles where he can't quite get a license to publish or a privilege du um, to publish his treatise. And so he's sort of stuck in this uh, limbo while he's back in Paris for a good 10 years until 1690, where he's finally able to publish his textbook um, called The Système. Um, in 1691, very quickly after, he changes the title um, to include Descartes' name, which is interesting, but it also, I think, the worst thing you can possibly do for your intellectual posterity is put Descartes' name in the title of your work. Uh, because people are just going to see Descartes everywhere and only Descartes, which I think is partially what happened to um, Regis. In this time, he has this sort of rapid flurry of uh, Cartesian polemics that he uh, launches into. So he has some very public exchanges um, in defense of Cartesianism, most famously with Uwe's Censura. Um, in 1692, he publishes a response to Jean Duhamel's uh, criticism of Regis' work. 
And in between, there are a few other minor exchanges, which I think make uh, Regis fairly interesting. So he enters into a debate with Henri Le Level, uh, Nicolas Malbranche, and a very minor exchange with Leibniz. In 1699, and this is speaking to his popularity, um, uh, Regis joins the newly reconstituted Académie des Sciences. Um, although, as far as I can tell, he was not very he was not particularly active in the academy. Um, as Fontenelle says in his eulogy, uh, he says, I mean, it's, 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 it's sort of mean-spirited, I suppose, but it was basically, we included Regi in the academy because if we didn't, people would ask, like, where's Regi? Um, which says something about his popularity, but also says something that he didn't really contribute much. As far as I can tell, the most that he contributed to the academy was leveraging his correspondence network um, to get different uh, observational reports from the south of France. And then there's one bit where he reports back on some tests he did of some mineral spring water uh, somewhere in the south of France. I, I, to be honest, I forget where. Um, but in 1704, even though he's not super active in the academy, mostly because he's, uh, his health is failing him at this point, he still manages in 1704 to publish um, uh, another book, this one called Usage de la Raison et de la Foi. Um caminho paciente para avaliação. Uh, but anyways, this, I think this book, it really represents his own view uh, and it is where he starts to step out uh, even more so out of the shadow of Descartes. So just some broad overview from 30,000 feet highlights of Regis philosophy. Um, his system or uh, cours, however you want to refer to it, was meant to be a Cartesian textbook that filled in the whole corpus. So he wanted to include an ethics and a political theory. Lots of this is verging on plagiarism. Uh, he steals very heavily from Thomas Hobbes, especially in the political thought, and steals from other people for various bits of the treatise, which I think makes him sort of interesting in a contextual sense. The main reason why I'm interested in him is because he's often referred to as a Cartesian empiricist, which might strike a lot of people as being sort of a, an unholy marriage of doctrine. Uh, Another big part of his philosophy is he positions himself against occasionalism and Malbranche, um, and instead he had, um, adopts a, a, a theory of secondary causes. So that's sort of a rough overview of who Regis is, some of the things that I think are interesting in his philosophy. But now we can get to my talk where I plan on saying ridiculous and unsubstantiated things, and hopefully everyone uh, will just accept them unquestioningly. But what I'm going to try to do in this talk is to in introduce um, two different problems. The first problem is uh, that Regis account of mind considered in itself seems like it has some internal contradic contradictions. On the other side, it seems that uh, Regis account of mind considered again in itself contradicts his empiricism. And these seem, seem to be sort of uh, situated as a dilemma where if you avoid one, you run into the other, et cetera. But my conclusion is gonna be that Regis can actually be saved from these problems and these contradictions by uh, understanding his theory of mind in a radically different way, sort of removing him from the Cartesian box that he's been put in. So what I'm gonna posit is a law of nature theory of mind, which probably makes no sense, but we'll see. Quick terminological clarification, and I imagine this is going to be important for the, the subsequent two talks. Regis adopts a lot of, I think, what would be considered standard Cartesian terminology. So, for example, the mind is just a spiritual substance, unextended, etc. The body, again, sort of in the standard Cartesian way, is just extended substance in length, width, and breadth. However, where his terminology is a little strange is he distinguishes between the mind and the soul. And so the mind is the spiritual substance, but the soul is just the union of the mind and body. And that's not, I don't think that's entirely accurate, but for the purpose of this paper, it's enough to get the ideas out. Um, so for Regi, the soul is just a mode, which means when the body perishes, the soul also perishes as well. 
which is controversial. And um, when he's talking about this, he sometimes vacillates between using mind and soul um, when it's convenient for him, especially when he's talking about the, soul, the, the minds of mortality, he uses the word soul. Um, I think this is just to avoid objections, but he usually really means mind. Um, and we'll encounter some of these difficulties later on in the talk. So the thing that interests me is Reiji's empiricism. And the reason why a lot of people uh, refer to him as empiricist is because he explicitly says this, uh, there is nothing in the understanding that has not uh, passed through the senses. And this looks probably familiar to a lot of you because it's basically the peripatetic axiom. Um, as Tad's pointed out, uh, there are minor differences where the intellect is changed to the understanding and in the senses it's changed to through the senses. Um, and that change I'm actually gonna be dwelling on for a little bit. So what are the senses for Reiji? And this is why that through the senses bit uh, becomes important. Um, for Reiji, he describes the senses as any physical motion in the sensory organs or brain that is perceived by the soul. That means uh, for Reiji, all mental faculties are going to have some sort of physical correlate, which means also that there is nothing like a pure understanding. And when he's using the word pure understanding, I think he means it basically in a Cartesian sense, where if you were, for Descartes, if you were a disembodied mind, I assume you could still reason, you could have clear and distinct perceptions, you could understand things purely by the intellect operating all on its own, uh, which Reiji denies, because you need senses and you're gonna need a body to get things going. So this is when we can start generating some of our problems. Uh, so the argument for mind-body distinction, I, I take it as pretty standard across Cartesians. So I just picked one at, I mean, not at random, I just like this one because it's fun to read. Um, so I picked an argument from Antoine Legon, and this is in Old English, so there, are, there actually are not typos, even though it looks like they're typos. Um, so I'll just read this really quickly. For if I attentively weigh and examine who I am, who write these things, who see, who hold the pen, who draw the lines, I know for certain that were the use of my hands taken away, my eyes digged out and my fingers cut off, I would neither write, see, not touch, but nevertheless should find it apparent that I yet exist. For my body may be dissevered into parts, yet nevertheless something of me may be remaining. And so the argument's really simple. You can just start cutting away everything that's inessential to you. And through this process of elimination, eventually you get to, you know, something like an incorporeal mind. And these arguments occur in like almost all of the early Cartesians, or the major ones at least, uh, even in Jacques Rolle. Uh, this is also this same style of argument also occurs numerous times. Uh, in Reiji. And at times he even holds up this type of argument as sort of the paradigm example of Cartesian analysis. So he's not just giving it lip service. So just to develop a little bit more how this tension is going to unfold, uh, we need to look at what the life of a disembodied mind looks like. Unfortunately, for someone like Descartes, he doesn't give us a lot of resources to work with. But we can sort of assume that for someone like Descartes, the life of the mind, a disembodied mind, is not going to be that dissimilar to the way we currently experience things. I mean, for sure, it's going to be different because we won't have our corporeal mind, we won't have our corporeal imagination, et cetera, but we'll still be able to reason, et cetera, et cetera. Um, for Reiji, it's not that simple. The nice thing is, though, he gives us a really robust um, description of what a disembodied mind looks like, and he actually includes this as uh, chapters in both uh, his later 1704 work and his initial textbook. And actually bits of the text are just lifted um, verbatim from the, from the first text and put into the second one. So he obviously found it important enough and correct enough to not change a single thing. I mean, there are minor variations, but it's almost verbatim. Um, so for him, a disembodied soul, uh, because it's uh, unextended is gonna have no location because it has no location, it can't be subject to movement. And for Reiji, movement and time are very closely related. So the disembodied soul is not really going to be subject to time. 
because it's not subject to time and has no location, he reasons it's also not going to be subject to change or succession of any type. Um, so you can't have even succession of different thoughts in a disembodied mind. Um, this entails that it, the disembodied soul is going to have no understanding or will. Although this deserves like an asterisk and some fine print um, because it's gonna have something lo like a will. Uh, and so we can see this in, in an anonymous reply to Henri Lelevel. Regi claims that like angels, a disembodied soul's will is fixed and immutable. So a disembodied will is going to look radically different than um, our type of will, which changes all the time. So now we can get to the two problems directly. It seems like because we're so intimately connected with our body and because he holds something like the peripatetic axiom uh, where everything needs to go through the senses, it seems like if we have no body, then you're going to have no thought. You're gonna be stuck in this immaterial stage where you know there's no change possible. So it seems like we're forced to say something like, um, thinking is not essential to the mind because it seems to only happen when you have a body. Thought might only be essential to um, the union, whereas in Reiji's uh, terminology, the soul. A possible solution would be just to deny that uh, the mind is essentially a thinking thing, but Reiji is wholeheartedly against this and frequently says that the mind is essentially a thinking thing. But you might say what it means to be a thinking thing could change. Maybe we're thinking only of a thing that can possibly think or can possibly have thoughts. Um, but that's gonna run into problems too, where it seems like if we have no thought, uh, actual thought, then you're gonna have no mind at all. Um, so if a disembodied mind is, is a thinking thing that is not thinking, it seems like it doesn't exist at all. And this is, I take this as the, the punchline of, numerous bad Cartesian jokes. Uh, when you stop thinking, you just blink out of existence. Uh, it seems like he would actually think something like this. Well, you might expect him to take, to distance himself from Descartes here and say that the soul maybe doesn't always think. But again, he denies this. So how can he hold all these contradictory things at the same time? Well, I wanna take each problem in turn and give what I think is Reiji's best available response. So how can a disembodied mind exist at all if it's not connected with a body? This is sort of the easy problem because Reiji is fairly direct about it. Uh, and I wanna just cite this one quote as giving, I think what is a potential answer that's just gonna open up more questions that hopefully we'll deal with later on. So he says, we thus attribute to the disembodied soul an actual love and knowledge of God in and of itself. And we are careful not to say that it has the faculties of feeling and imagining because these faculties depend on the union of the mind and body. So um, we have some actual knowledge of God in itself. Uh, the mind has knowledge of God in itself and a love of God in itself. At all times, this is an active um, love that's constant. So you can say the mind is actually doing a particular type of thought. Although what that means to have a particular thought is going to be sort of problematic as well. But this brings us to a hard problem where it seems like this explicitly contradicts his empiricism, or at least you have two objects of knowledge of yourself and of God that didn't pass through the senses or that could exist in a completely disembodied mind, which would contradict his a peripatetic axiom and also the idea that there is no such thing as pure understanding because it seems like you have two objects of pure understanding. But to start to solve all these problems, I wanna to point to a particular passage in the usage where Reiji cites St. Augustine. And here he says, St. Augustine teaches formally the doctrine in the fourth, uh, fourth chapter of the 10th book of On the Trinity, where he says that mind, knowledge, and love are substantially the same thing. In effect, if the mind did not know itself and love itself through itself, it would know and love itself through some other thing, and this other thing would be known and loved by some other thing, and so on to infinity. Obviously, the infinite regress, he rejects. 
And so you have to know and love yourself through yourself. I want to key in on two little bits of this passage. One, the first italicized bit, that the mind, knowledge, and love are substantially the same thing. And the second bit, that uh, you know and love yourself through yourself. And I think in cashing out these little bits of this passage, we're going to come to a solution. And this is where I say wild, unsubstantiated things. Um, I think basically he's seen the, the role of the mind as radically different than the role that the Cartesians usually uh, let it play. And he's gonna instead be positioning the mind as essentially a law of nature. And so to draw this analogy, I wanna look at some of the laws of nature that he talks about. And this comes out most clearly when he's talking about uh, the laws of motion as eternal truths. And as such, for Rigi, he argues that they are eternal. Once they're created, they're there, they're going to be unchanging, um, sort of. I take this to be the standard Cartesian line. Also very interesting, the laws of nature lack um, a type of particularity. The way he says it is laws regard the movement of simple bodies, which is to say stripped of sensible qualities and rules, on the other hand, concern the movement of bodies reclothed in these very qualities. So laws are objects moving around in an idealized state, um, sort of governed by the laws of basic laws of mechanics and geometry, but they might not have any real relation to our uh, observed experience. Also, I think fairly interesting he seems to be pretty direct that the laws of nature are themselves substances. Uh, he mentions this at a couple times, but it comes out most clearly in the, and conveniently for me, in the glossary of terms uh, in the end of his uh, cour, where he says, eternal truths of which the laws of nature and laws of motion are contained are nothing other than the substances themselves that God created. And finally, the laws of nature work to govern or limit motions. They're sort of the outer bounds of what is possible. Now we look at the mind, it's going to have all of these same properties. Um, for um, Regi, he claims that the mind is eternal in a sense, that once it's created, it's going to remain in existence forever. It would take some, uh, some miracle, some divine miracle um, to destroy a mind after it's created. But also, as we saw earlier, because you have this just general love of self and general love of God that's constant and never changing in a disembodied state, you can see that the mind also lacks a particular type of particularity. The mind is also obviously substantial, which I think is, again, standard Cartesian line. But what's interesting, too, is this love of God and love of self serve to govern or limit our thoughts. Essentially, uh, when Regi fills in his ethical theory, he's going to take a hard egoist, uh, uh, ethical egoist position where he's going to say that every action that you do is actually directed towards um, love of self or potentially love of God, although that's more complicated. He even goes so far as to say that your particular thoughts serve to modify these original thoughts of love of self or love of God, or knowledge of self or knowledge of God, which makes them, again, very unlike the way that we usually think of um, the Cartesian mind. I think it's much easier to think of it as doing this weird role of acting like a law of nature. And I think there are a lot of uh, upsides to this, this, this um, theory, I guess. One, we can start to see the soul as like a quasi-primary cause. It gives a little more oomph when we're actually embodied. And this gives us lots of resources to help further analyze uh, Reiji's position because there's lots of talk about secondary causes um, in his work. Further, we can solve the disappearing mind problem because in the same way that a law of nature doesn't disappear, the mind won't disappear because it has something that's constant and active, although maybe not um, particular in the world. And we can also make sense of 
the mind knowing itself through itself, because just like uh, a law of nature gains particularity when you have some like real objects moving around, um, the mind is going to have the same thing when it modifies these original thoughts. The big thing I think though, is that it avoids contradicting his version of the peripatetic axiom. And how it does this is a little more than I can give in this talk, but the short and sweet of it is I think Reiji just thinks this kind of knowledge is radically different than our other kinds of knowledge um, and shouldn't be um, applicable to, uh, it shouldn't be applied, the, the peripatetic axiom should not apply to these types of knowledge because they are general and more law-like than our regular bits of knowledge. And I have some arguments about this, about even how he structures um, the treatises that he's working on, how he separates this out. Um, but again, this would be getting into the nitty gritty details that are uh, too much for this uh, talk. Finally, I think it also helps solve another oddity in uh, Reiji's philosophy. When he's talking about innate ideas, um, this would seem like another thing that could not survive the peripatetic axiom. But Reiji actually bites a pretty big bullet on this one um, and adopts what uh, Antonello de Prete has said is the sensualist theory of innate ideas. And essentially he says that our innate ideas of God are actually in the body. Uh, and so when we become a soul, that is when the mind unites with the body, that's when we sort of get this innate idea of God. But as I've already pointed out earlier on, he seems to already say that we have an innate idea of God in the mind already. In a disembodied mind, you're gonna have knowledge of self and you're gonna have knowledge of God. It seems funny that he would give two accounts of innate knowledge of God. And I think my solution partially explains that. He's really thinking, this, thinking of this as a different kind of knowledge. So we make a distinction to avoid a contradiction. Um, but there are probably some downsides to my theory. Um, you know, likely doesn't make any sense, um, but that's probably just, you know, <laughs> call for more work, in my opinion. Um, it also has problems of individuation for disembodied souls because it's gonna look like um, we're all exactly the same, where we all have exactly the same knowledge of self and knowledge of God. And so like we would all be just like one big substance in a disembodied life. Um, that seems really problematic, but I think that's sort of entailed by his theory. And again, not so much a downside as I think room for further um, research. There's also going to be free will problems where it seems like everything that happens in the will happens through the body, but the body is governed by physics. The laws of physics are deterministic. And so you get this sort of standard objection that we see in the Descartes Elizabeth correspondence. But again, I think this is room for further research. And I think this is just a problem that Reiji probably just doesn't have an answer to. But in the end, I think we have a picture of Reiji that highlights some of his tension in his philosophy, but also hopefully gives some weird and innovative possible solution. So I think I'll just leave it at that. And thanks for your attention. Thank you. Thank you, Aaron. I think we should move uh, straight away to our second talk tonight, which is uh, that small talk on the Regis system as Cartesian curse courses. Ted, you have Thank you. Thanks. Um, uh, thanks to Aaron for organizing uh, this session and thinking of me as, as a participant. I'm going to share my screen. Same picture of uh, Reishi. Um, so I, I'll do a combination of reading and presenting. I'll start out with a, a short introduction here. So the project of presenting Cartesian views in a manner suitable for teaching started with Descartes himself. This is clear from the history of his Principia Philosophiae, which was first published in 1644. In the 1640 letter to Mersenne, Descartes announces this work as encore de ma philosophie that serves as an alternative to the current philosophy text used in the schools. He also notes his plan to publish this work with an annotated copy 
of a uh, standard textbook of the French Cistercian, Eustachius uh, Asoctopalo. Descartes abandoned this project in, uh, by 1641, due in part to his discovery that Eustachius had died, but also claims in a 1642 letter to Denae that he still intends in his Principia to present his philosophy and to quote, a style more suited to current practice in the schools, end quote. In particular, he modeled this text on a relatively new French genre of uh, philosophy cursus, for which Eustachius' textbook provided a notable model. The new cursus bypassed the need for laborious investigations of Aristotle's own works by presenting the basic elements of a properly Christianized Aristotelian position in a readily accessible form. Descartes clearly intended his Principia to present in a similar way basic elements of his own system and thus to promote its dissemination within the French Academy. So let me start out by saying a bit about the scholastic curs uh, cursus and that's um, Eustachius's uh, text is the example here. So we have two uh, basic parts, each divided into two, uh, four in total. Uh, first, two parts have to do with uh, the practical sciences. So there's dialectic or logic, uh, which is the science of reason that governs the intellect, and then ethics or morals, and they're presented in this order, which is the science of action, which governs the will. And uh, these two are to be sort of basic preparation for uh, more speculative parts of um, philosophy. So there's physics as the science of natural body uh, presented third. And then last, you have metaphysics, the science of being as such. Uh, and the order here is explained by the fact that you, the physics is closer to the senses, metaphysics more abstract. So you start out with what's less abstract and move on to the more abstract. Um, okay. So let's compare to uh, Descartes' Principia. First thing to note is there are no sections on the practical sciences, on logic and morals in Descartes' text. And Partly in order to address this fact in, in a preface to the French translation of the Principia, um, Descartes did provide some discussion of logic and morals and indicated how they fit into a system. So first regarding uh, logic, he says, and um, this is drawing on his discussion in the uh, earlier discourse. So after, he forms a code for regulating action. He says, one should study logic. I do not mean the logic of the schools, for this is strictly speaking nothing but a dialectic, which teaches ways of expounding what one already knows, or even of holding forth without judgment about things one does not know. I mean instead the kind of logic which teaches us to direct our reason with a view to discovering the truths of which we are ignorant and the reference here is to the four rules uh, that he presented in the discourse. And the suggestion here is that that is supposed to replace scholastic syllogistic logic. In place of that, you substitute um, the much shorter discussion uh, rules of method. Regarding morals, so it's clear that he thinks logic should come first. Uh, and instead of being followed by ethics, as, as in Eustachius' text and his standard in, scholastic, uh, in the scholastic cursus, he indicates that the study of ethics or morals is really supposed to come last. So he says, by morals, I understand the highest and most perfect moral system, which presupposes a complete knowledge of the other sciences and is the ultimate level of wisdom. Okay, so, in uh, Descartes' ordering, you have logic, then uh, metaphysics, physics, and finally, morals. Okay. Uh, now, 
he does include, so, so logic and, and ethics or morals are not included as part of his cursus in the Principia. He does, of course, include discussions of um, metaphysics and physics out of scholastic order because metaphysics comes first. But there are certain ways in which um, uh, Descartes' discussion of this is, uh, of these areas are incomplete relative to what you find in the scholastic texts. So for instance, in his uh, treatment of metaphysics, it's uh, incomplete. Uh, standard for scholastic discussions is that you um, say something about the relation between essence and existence. There's no such discussion in, in Descartes. Uh, and there's no discussion of pure intelligences. Generally, you had a discussion of pure intelligences where those are distinguished from rational human souls. As Aaron noted, we do find a discussion of that in Regis. Um, and in that way, Regis is closer to the sort of scholastic treatments of metaphysics. Also by Descartes own admission, this is from the preface again, his treatment of physics is incomplete relative to what you find in the scholastic cursus. So he says, but in order to bring the plan to conclusion, I should have to go on to explain the nature of all the particular bodies that exist on this earth, namely minerals, plants, animals, and most importantly, man. I think that future generations will forgive me if from now on I give up working on their behalf. So Descartes admits this is not a complete cursus. It doesn't have the practical sciences and it's uh, incomplete, especially with regard to its discussion of physics. So the Principia doesn't render redundant later attempts to offer more complete versions of a Cartesian cursus. The first one that I know of, um, and this is from 1654, is from Jacques Durore, uh, La philosophie divisée en toutes ses parties. Um, there, as the subtitle indicates, there's a comparison of ancient and new authors and principally of the Peripatetics and Descartes. So this is in line actually with Descartes' initial plan to publish his philosophy side by side with the Eustachiuses uh, in a comparative sort of way. Um, but uh, in this way, it differs from Regis' system, which doesn't have this sort of format. It doesn't have a comparison of ancients and moderns. It just straightforwardly presents his version of the Cartesian system. But in this respect, Regis' system is in fact more akin to Descartes' Principia, which doesn't have the detailed comparison that he initially planned. But in another respect, both Durore's work and uh, Regis's uh, differ from the Principia. They're written in the vernacular. They're not written in Latin, the language of the schools. Uh, and I wanna say a bit more about that later on. Okay. So I'll give you a timeline. Aaron covered some of this. So I'll be a little brief on some of the points. So um, we had, uh, Regis being um, dissuaded from his studies in the uh, theology by Rose, sorry, but uh, uh, mistake there, Rose, shouldn't have that you, uh, Mercedes. Um, and he went to Toulouse and uh, the other uh, provincial parts of France as a kind of Cartesian missionary in 1665. Now I'm going to mention something that might seem irrelevant, but actually is quite relevant in the context of a consideration of the reception of um, Descartes in early modern France. And that's the relation to Jansenism, the theology of Cornelius Jansen. So um, prior to 1668, there was a concerted effort on the part of uh, both Rome and Paris to suppress the teaching of Jansenism, which is seen as uh, politically and theologically subversive. Uh, and this involved uh, Louis XIV um, persecuting 
uh, Port Royal, um, the Abbey at Port Royal and the associated schools, which were seen as a sort of bastion of Jansenism. In 1668, there was a start of what was called, what's called the uh, Pays de l'Eglise, uh, a sort of truce negotiated between Louis XIV and Pope Clement IX, um, which lasted for about a decade. And during that time, one wasn't supposed to engage in open warfare against uh, Jansen and the Jansens. So that's one thing, I I'll come back to the, uh, Jan the issue of Jansenism and the pay in just a bit. In 1671, there was a royal decree at the University of Paris that uh, in which Louis XIV condemned opinions that as he put it, could bring some confusion in our mysteries. And the mysteries here were um, the, well, in particular, the mystery of the Eucharist. And what prompted this, and I've argued this elsewhere, I'll just say dogmatically, what prompted this was the publication of some uh, attempts to show that Cartesian matter theory is compatible with Catholic teachings on the Eucharist and uh, Robert Degabe was one who published that and we'll be talking more about Degabe in just a bit. Now the opinion, the decree, I'm sorry, didn't actually mention either Descartes or Cartesianism, but it's clear that that was the target. It couldn't be Jansenism, right? because uh, Pays de, de, de l'Eglise was still in force, but we had a or sort of effort to suppress Cartesianism during the 1670s coming out of this royal decree. Uh, and what I've argued is, again, I'll say it dogmatically, there's a kind of proxy war here against Jansenism. You couldn't criticize Jansenism but you could criticize Cartesianism. The Royal Decree gave you leave to do that. And so that's what happened. And I think there was a kind of proxy war going on there. So in 1679, there was the effective end of the pay uh, and the revival of the persecution of Port Royal. Why is that significant? The following year, Regis returns to Paris in the sort of fraught political environment, Cartesianism, have been associated with Jansenism. There was an end to the Pays de l'Eglise um, and Jansenism was again a hot topic. And Regi came back to Paris and wanted to give public lectures a la Rouault and to publish his system. Um, but the Archbishop of Paris prohibited both of those, both the lectures and the um, permission to publish. And I think we can understand why, given the, the heating up of the war against Jansenism and the continuing war against Cartesianism, the continuation of it is shown by the fact that in 1680, uh, there was a work published against Descartes that focuses in particular on the issue of the Eucharist. Okay, so at this point in time, uh, the Archbishop really wasn't in a position to allow for Regi to, um, to continue the, to, to give these public lectures and to publish a work that defended Cartesianism. So uh, to continue the, the timeline, there's a long period uh, during which uh, Regi tried to get uh, the archbishop to agree to publication and it's clear that during this time, there were revisions in the system. Uh, for instance, an interesting section um, of the book on physics, the part of the system on physics, he in fact rejects Descartes' pineal gland theory in favor of the identification of the soul with the central oval. And this is in Vuissant's uh, Neurographia Universalis of 1684, which he cites explicitly. So we know he had probably added that uh, during this period. And also um, we know from um, a draft of the section on morals um, that he did significantly revise this. Um, and the indications are, and this is something art, uh, argued in a volume that includes a chapter from Antonella on this draft of the system. 
from the changes, you can see that, well, there's uh, moves away from Jansenism or stress on the egoistical nature of our action and, um, and more of an, em an increasing emphasis on um, the, the powers of the king and on Gallicanism, which was a big issue at this time as well. So R Regis is clearly modifying this section to make it acceptable in the particular political environment he was in. So finally, Arlay was worn down uh, by this, agrees in 1688 to, to uh, for publication. It's published uh, in Paris in 1690, in 1691 in a retitled edition that includes Descartes' name in the title. The first edition couldn't, by the agreement for uh, publication, couldn't include that. Although we'll see later on, even in the first edition, Regis hardly hid his uh, connections to Descartes. So, uh, and this is something I'll just mention very quickly because um, Aaron went over it. So Regis and the system um, were at the center of disputes over Cartesianism in France during the last decade of the 17th century. There are various responses to the system and um, we had the engagement with UA as well, who called um, Regis the prince of the Cartesians. Um, Sam Newlands indicated to me that's like saying he's the prince of darkness. Uh, okay. So first thing to note about the system is its Cartesian ordering. So this is from the preface. Morals supposes physics, physics supposes metaphysics, and metaphysics logic. And by this means all the parts of philosophy have such a relation and such a connection together that I believe that all that results from their assembly can justly be called the general system of philosophy. So this is the order Descartes recommended in the preface to the French translation of the Principia. You start with logic, you do metaphysics to ground your physics, and then you have last a discussion of morals. The difference is that in uh, Regis, you actually do have a discussion of logic and morals, which as I noted are missing in uh, the Principia. So, um, in some sense, this is a Cartesian text, but the relation to Descartes is complicated. So this is again, Regis, uh, from the preface, all that I have said must be attributed to Monsieur Descartes, whose method and principles I have followed, even in explanations that are different from his, right? So there's an, and this is from the first edition published in Paris, right? So he's not hiding his connection to Descartes here. He says, attribute my views to Descartes, but note that there are differences and even as we'll see some fundamental differences with Descartes uh, in his, in Regis work. Okay, so let's talk about the, some initial deviations from Descartes. Um, so the section on logic, Descartes says, limit that to the four rules of method um, Regis doesn't do that in the system. Um, he notes that the section draws on reflections that have been proposed by the author of the Art de Pensée, to which it is difficult not to add anything. And in fact, as um, Aaron noted, it's pretty much plagiarized <laughs> from that work. Uh, what's interesting is that it follows the Port Royal logic in organizing the discussion of logic in a scholastic way around the three operations of mind and uh, includes a section on method. So this is just standard um, sort of scholastic procedure. And in the discussion of reasoning as in the lo Horea logic, there's a extended discussion of the syllogism, rules governing the syllogism. So in, in both these texts, you have um, a, a endorsement of the sort of logic that Descartes wanted to reject and replace, which is interesting. 
The section on morals in the system is not particularly Cartesian and probably is the least Cartesian of the sections of the system. So there's a basic division into uh, natural, civil, and Christian morals. And um, as Aaron alluded to, that's really drawn from Hobbes or perhaps Pufendorf, nothing like that in Descartes. Uh, and there, there are strong connections to Hobbes, which I think were toned down in the revisions during the 1680s. But one striking similarity has to do with um, uh, the formation of civil society depending on a contract involving the surrender of rights. That's all familiar from Hobbes. Uh, Regis no doubt knew it from Hobbes and included it in this section as part of his political theory. Again, nothing particularly Cartesian about that. Okay, um, let me catch up with where I am here. There are other deviations from Descartes that I think we can understand in terms of a distinction that we find in uh, Degabe. So Degabe distinguished between two different supplements to Cartesian philosophy. First is a first supplement, um, which Degabe claims to present insofar as I try to rectify Descartes' own thoughts on matters where it seems to me that he is left the correct path that leads to truth. And secondly, there's a second supplement that involves this from uh, Degabe, the new application that one would make of his incontestable principles to phenomena that he has not known or to truths of which he has not spoken. He gives a number of uh, examples, including a misspelled again, Roe, sorry about that, uh, De La Forge, Claubert and others. Um, which they produced in excellent works they've given to the public where one sees the manner we should extend our thoughts to equally excellent and useful matters. So in the first supplement, you depart from fundamental features of Descartes system in order to correct him. In the second, you're not correcting Descartes as much as really supplementing him by extending his views to uh, issues he hadn't considered wasn't in a position to consider. Now we know that there was a connection, clear connection here between Degabe and Regis. It was um, noted in back in the 17th century. So uh, the, there's the claim, uh, early modern claim, Regis had a great deal to do with Father Degabe and he profited greatly from his illuminations in the three volumes of his philosophy that he published. And the debt to uh, Degabe was noted by Regis himself, and this is in the Usage, 1704, called De Degabe the greatest metaphysician of our age. Okay, so I think we can see both a first and second supplement in the system. With regard to the second supplement, we have this from Fouché's letter to Leibniz. You know that I think Regi has given the public a great system of philosophy in three quarto volumes with several figures. This work contains many important treatises, such as the one on percussion by Marriott, chemistry by La Marie, medicine by Dusson and uh, Duvernay. He even speaks of my uh, treatise on hygrometers, although he does not name it. There isn't it a good portion of the physics of Arrow, where Andy refutes their father Malbranche, Perrault, Varignon, the first of these concerning ideas, the second concerning weight, the third was recently been received by the Academy Royale des Sciences, also on weight, the meteors of uh, Father Lamy, also in part adorns his work, and the remainder is from Descartes. So we have a the sense here that um, Regis and the system is updating Descartes, right? Taking into account all these works that followed his death uh, and making uh, the view more current. This would count as a second supplement. But I think we also see, can see the system as including a, what Degabe calls a first supplement, 
Uh, and so um, Aaron mentioned uh, the empiricist aspects of Regis's epistemology um, and philosophy of mind, which uh, he inherited from Degabay as well. I'm going to mention a couple things from the section on metaphysics where uh, the, the influence of Degabay is rather striking. So in Degabay, we have this view that the Descartes' doctrine of the creation of eternal truths requires what Degabay called the indefectibility of creatures, which was the view that created substances as opposed to modes are atemporal and thus unchangeable or indefectible. Modes, on the other hand, are going to be temporal, successive, and defectible. Okay, so there's a fundamental substance mode distinction where substances have an atemporality that their modes lack. And atemporality and thus an indefectibility. And I think Regi in the system just picks this up from Degabay. In the system, the distinction is between God's creation of permanent substances that are not subject to change, which is contrasted with the conservation of successive, what Regis called successive modal beings. And this is directly contrary, of course, to Descartes' view in the third meditation that there's a, merely a distinction of reason between uh, creation and conservation. Regi, following Degabay, is drawing a more fundamental distinction here, uh, tying creation to permanent substances and reserving conservation for successive modes. And there's also a further very interesting consequence of uh, Regis' acceptance of the uh, indefectibility doctrine from Degabay. In particular, he argues that divisibility pertains not to bodily substance itself, but to quantite, namely body considered according to such and such size. So bodily substance itself is indivisible for Regis, he accepts a kind of monism, right? There's one indivisible uh, extended substance, and then there are diverse modes that are the particular bodies, and those modes are going to be divisible, substance won't be. And of course, this deviates from uh, Descartes' view that divisibility is essential to bodily substance, and in fact, is what distinguishes bodily substance from is one feature that distinguishes bodily substance from mental substance. Okay. Let me conclude by talking a little bit about the purpose of the system. What, what was the target audience here? Now you might say, well, it was targeted for the classroom, right? It's a textbook, it's a cursus. Cursus was used in the classroom, so um, seems that that's how it was really directed. And this might seem to be indicated by the Principia, right? The Principia clearly was targeted towards the schools for use in the schools and replacement of the scholastic cursus. Um, I mean, of course that didn't happen, but I think that was the intent Descartes had in publishing his system in the cursus form. But I want to emphasize that I think the system wasn't produced for that reason. Uh, rather, it was produced as a more, for a more popular audience outside of the schools. And in this way, it's similar to other scholastic manuals produced in French during this time. I give you some examples here. So this is, um, you know, the curses for the common man and women, um, where uh, it's targeted towards people who want sort of a, a university education, but without going to university and learning Latin. Uh, and I think there was a market there for this sort of text, as indicated by these other uh, scholastic um, textbooks. And I think uh, Regis, in distinction from Descartes, was trying to get in on that market. 
Um, so the suggestion here is there was a kind of market for scholastic manuals outside the university. And here I'm influenced by Anne Blair's claim. Um, I'll just quote it. The first vernacular textbooks of Aristotelian natural philosophy testified to the broadening, broadening of the audience seeking a university style education. These books probably appealed to privately trained noblemen, to students so weak in Latin that they needed a vernacular crib, to intellectually ambitious barber surgeons or artisans, and to women who couldn't get a university education. I think that was the market for both Duror's Cartesian cursus and for Regis's system. Um, I think I'll end there. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Dad. So let's move um, to our third speaker tonight and the third paper. So Antonella del Pretre, uh, Cartesian Psychology, Regis on Imagination, Memory and Judgment. Antonella, you have the floor. Thank you. Uh, um, I would like to thank uh, Aaron for, because he proposed me to participate to this panel. Um, the focus of my presentation uh, is a bit different for my first uh, initial proposition, because uh, as often is the, the case in examining the texts, I found some unexpected elements. Um, my presentation will therefore include uh, uh, two parts. Uh, in the first one, I will speak about uh, uh, Regis' the theory of causa causation, and in the second one, I will speak about the psychology of uh, the system. And I will share my screen. Okay. Um, Regis' name is generally closely linked to uh, his rejection of uh, occasionalism. Mm. Okay. Uh, his concept of substance and his neosiology. Most of his contemporaries, however, were not concerned about uh, this part of his thought, but instead were interested in, in his physics. I, um, um, I, I found the same quotation uh, than um, uh, Ted, and I, I just want to, um, to remark that there are so many uh, important scientists of his time that, that are uh, quoted by, uh, mentioned by uh, Fouché, and uh, that are very important sources of uh, uh, the system. Um, physics, uh, uh, the, the physics of uh, uh, Regis is not really very original. Uh, is very often is a, a just a summary uh, of uh, uh, his sources. But I think that being original uh, was not Regis' goal. In the preface of his system, he states that looking for novelty is not his primary intention. He aims at writing a work in which well-known things are set out in an order that can be called systematic. This systematic concern has a particular aspect in physics. The GIS aimed to connect experiences in the, to the explanation and explanation to more general supposition and to organize the hypothesis into a coherent whole. By looking how uh, Regis organizes his sources, uh, we thus see the formation of an original thought, which is by no means a mere repetition of Descartes' philosophy. I am to illustrate how this originality is being constructed in the last sections of the physics where Regis deals with the operation of imagination, memory, and judgment. Regis uh, joins the neurophysiological tradition of Descartes and Willis. Mental function, uh, as Aaron and Ted uh, um, have just said, 
do have some physiological counterpart. He masters the most recent developments of neurophysiology and philosophy on this question. He mentions not only Descartes and Willis, but also Nicolas Malbranche and Claude Perrault. There are, however, two very uh, sources, important sources. Raymond Viesson's uh, Neurographia Universalis uh, and Laforge, uh, Traité de l'Esprit de l'Homme. In first approach, we can say that the anatomical description of the brain is inspired by the sons and that the physiology and psychological explication of sensation and imagination is based on Malbranche and Laforge. Exploring the relationship between Regis and the sons allow us to find information about Regis' scientific activities during his days in Montpellier his intellectual affinity with or opposition to Malbranche and the stratification of the system. Viessens was a head physician in Montpellier and was a, a renowned anatomist. His neurographia attests um, a certain acquaintance uh, of Regis since uh, uh, on at least two occasions, Viessens states that he conducted experiments with him in December uh, 1680 and February uh, 1681. This is not the only clue to the close intellectual uh, relationship between uh, Viessons and Regis. Regis borrows some uh, illustration from uh, Neurographia, as you can see on the screen. On the uh, uh, left side, you have uh, the, the illustration of Neurographia, and on the right side, you have the uh, illustration uh, of the system. And there is also another one, and they are very, very similar. But there are also other similarities between uh, uh, Viesson's uh, Neurographia and Regis system. Uh, the, the description of the function of the brain is very, very similar. The partition of the cognitive function of the brain is the same, just as the order and even uh, the titles of the chapters. Considering the respective dates of publication of uh, Neurographia and uh, the system, from these similarities, uh, we could uh, deduce uh, an univocal and uh, unidirectional process that attests uh, Regis' appropriation of Viesson's anatomy and physiology. But uh, we would be wrong. Viesson uh, explicitly refers to Regis' uh, metaphysics uh, in delineating his own conception of the mind-body union, and he mentions the physics. I'm sorry, I'm not uh, enough uh, fluent in English to translate Latin or French, so my quotation will be in the original language. Uh, and you can see that uh, the, 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 the metaphysics of uh, uh, Regis is explicitly uh, mentioned uh, in, by Viessons uh, when he is speaking about the union, um, the mind-body union. To resume, uh, this is a confirmation of the fact uh, attested by biographers that Regis had uh, already completed the reduction of the system in the early 80s, uh, just as uh, uh, Aaron and uh, um, Ted um, uh, said and that he shared some copies of his work. Uh, so uh, Regis shared with Viessons uh, at least some parts of his system. Viessons invited him to attend his experiments and referred to Regis' system, uh, physics and metaphysics in his uh, Neurographia. And then Regis widely used the Neurographia in the system whose description of neurophysiology is largely coincident with that of uh, Viessons. 
I have been focusing on the similarities uh, between these decks, uh, and now it's this time to analyze some differences. Gessons make an extensive use of occasionalist vocabulary to describe the relationship between the soul and the body. Speaking about sensation, uh, he states that the difference between the external senses and the soul is only a difference of reason, and that the body acts, acts as an occasional cause, which by God's will excites certain, certain perception of, in the soul when some changes in the senses occur. A little farther on, he clearly distinguishes between God, the only efficient cause, and the action of the striated bodies in the brain, which are occasional causes. The same pattern is reproduced uh, with regard to imagination. Uh, if we compare these, uh, uh, the, the, the correspondent um, part of the uh, physics, uh, this compa comparison is very enlightening. Uh, sometimes Regis uses an occasion occasionalist terminology, but this is utilization is generic and he never mentions occasional causes. Quite the contrary, describing sensation, imagination, memory, and passion in, in physics, he identifies their physical causes. The mismatch between Viesson's statement in Neurographia and Regis' doctrine in the system can be explained if we assume that Regis had an occasionalistic period in early 80s, uh, which has gone unnoticed uh, by the scholars till now. However, we, had, uh, we need to deepen our understanding of uh, Regis' views about uh, occasionalism. Although Regis uh, avoids uh, uh, occasional causes, uh, his description of the soul-body unions remains uh, uh, strongly occasionalistic and malbranchian. I don't uh, quote, uh, uh, um, I don't read all the quotation, but I, I just want to uh, remark the expression loi de l'union, which is very, very similar to uh, what Malbranche says in the uh, research. There is no communication between the soul and the body, but just a correspondence between some modif modification of the body and some modification of the soul. Uh, this correlation is established uh, by God and follows a specific laws. Uh, lastly, it is God that produces the changes in the soul. We would expect an occasionalistic conclusion after this, uh, uh, this uh, text. Instead, Regis immediately after affirms that the body is the physical cause of the sensation and explains he reasons for this choice. You can read Veritable cause physique et naturelle des sensations. As he stresses below dealing with imagination, physical causes do not, do not really act, but they are necessary condition of a given state of the soul. Nous entendons uh, par cause physique non des causes qui agissent véritablement sur l'âme, car le corps n'a point cette puissance, mais des causes dont l'action suivant les lois de l'union de l'esprit et du corps est nécessairement suivie des perceptions de l'âme. This terminological choice is grounded in an explicit refusal of uh, occasional causes that we can read in the metaphysics. Regis explains that they conflict with God's immutability because they determine God's will to act in a specific way. In this chapter, uh, Regis prefers to speak of secondary efficient causes. 
this insight uh, into the theory of causality in the metaphysics, however, raises a several question about uh, his compatibility with the uh, Regis statements in the, in the physics. First, Regis uses a different terminology. Uh, there are no physical causes in the metaphysics and there are no secondary uh, efficient causes in Regis' account of sensation, imagination, and memory. Moreover, in his metaphysics, Regis stresses the fact that uh, secondary efficient causes have no uh, positive action. In his physics, instead, he emphasizes the importance of the brain as a physical cause and maintains that without the brain, any change, uh, um, without uh, um, any brain change, good would not produce our sensation. Uh, concerning efficacy, in the system, Regis mostly holds that physical or secondary efficient causes have no efficacy. But uh, sometimes, uh, as we have seen, it seems to state uh, the contrary. This inconsistency is perhaps due to the fact that Regis theory of causality is constantly moving and changing. We can spot, uh, if I am right in my interpretation, uh, at least three steps. First, Viessons attests that Regis' account of the soul body union endorses occasional causes in early 80s. Then in uh, 1690, uh, Regis rejects occasional causes and experiments other theories of causality. He speaks of physical causes or secondary efficient causes, and his description of these different types of causation is not always consistent, especially regarding efficacy. Since no manuscript has been preserved attesting to different drafts of the metaphysics and physics, we cannot determine whether these inconsistencies are the result of the coexistence of two layers of the text, which are not uh, sufficiently harmonized. In the system, however, Regis holds that uh, uh, such causes uh, have no efficacy, as I, I just said. When Regis publishes uh, L'usage de la raison et de la foi, instead, uh, secondary causes are described as real positive and efficacious. Uh, as uh, you can see on the screen and you can read on the screen, quant à la source, uh, the second quotation, quant à la source de l'efficacité des causes secondes, nous demeurons d'accord qu'elle consiste dans les facultés que Dieu leur a départies, telles qu'il a voulu, mais parce que ces facultés sont quelque chose de très réel, de très positif, qui n'est pas dans Dieu, mais dans la créature même, Nous disons qu'outre la puissance que Dieu, de Dieu qui s'étend à tout, il faut reconnaître dans les créatures une efficacité propre et particulière qui répond aux effets que Dieu produit euh, par leurs moyens. Uh, dans, uh, in, the, uh, in the usage, what makes the difference between primary causes and secondary causes is henceforth the uh, absence of in the independence of the secondary causes and no longer the lack of efficacy or action as it was uh, in the system. I tried to uh, give a, a brief, uh, uh, a quick summary of uh, uh, this uh, Regis theory of, uh, of uh, causation and if I am right uh, in uh, this uh, dynamic exegesis, uh, we need to slightly modify San Giacomo's interpretation of Regis' theory of uh, causation, because we have two uh, different 
the first difference uh, is that the, there is a first step of uh, Regis theory of causation, uh, according to Vietzons, uh, and in this, in this first step, uh, Regis endorses occasional causes. There is then a second step, the best known step um, in the system where secondary efficient uh, or instrumental causes or physical causes uh, have no efficacy. And then there is a last step in uh, um, 1704 where physical causes and instrumental causes do have does have, do have efficacy we have just explored uh, regis complex attitude toward occasional causes i have no no not enough uh, time to um, to explain uh, in the details is uh, psychology in uh, the in the system what i want just uh, remarks is that uh, the um, uh, the endorsement of the um, uh, cartesian neurophysiology uh, updated by the sons is a, 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 a manner a way for uh, regis to stand up against other theories of uh, um, of uh, other uh, about uh, psychology just like uh, uh, the theories of perot uh, expo um, which uh, uh, in uh, his essay de physique um, holds that uh, um, the soul does not uh, um, senses imagine and uh, remember uh, in uh, uh, in the brain but uh, directly in the in the senses but what 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 uh, uh, is very interesting for me is that the um, the um, psychological chapter of the system um, uses uh, uh, the neurographia of the sons but in the same time they uses, uh, they largely, widely uses Malbranche and Laforge. But uh, this use is uh, in fact a, ma a manipulation of uh, Malbranche and Laforge because uh, um, Regis um, uh, rejects pure uh, uh, intellect, uh, pure intellect, pure understanding, just, just as uh, um, Aaron uh, um, said, and uh, uh, this is uh, very clear. This man this kind of manipulation is very clear if we, uh, we uh, consider uh, the uh, the part of the system uh, which is uh, um, which is devoted to uh, the uh, habits. Uh, this part uh, is a, a summary of uh, some uh, uh, text of Anna Branche in the research. On the, on the left uh, side of the screen, you have the uh, text of Regis. On the, on the right, you have a quotation of the research. Malbranche um, uh, treats of uh, uh, habits in uh, two uh, different parts of the research. The first part in, is in the, in the book uh, two, and he speaks about uh, um, uh, bodily habits. And then in the septième l'écarcissement, he speaks about spiritual habits. What is uh, clear is that spiritual habits uh, have no correspondence, physical correspondence in the brain. And the the thesis, the Regis thesis is just the opposite, as you can see. You can see that Regis uh, pick up uh, some quotation from our branch, and uh, um, and uh, um, and uh, uh, mix them with some parts which are absent uh, in the text of our branch, and where he. Uh, uh, he, 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 he holds that 
spiritual habits have a, co a, a physical correspondence in, in the brain. Um, this is uh, uh, this presentation of the uh, psychology uh, by Regis in the system is not uh, the final account of Regis neotheology. When he publishes uh, uh, the usage de la raison et de la foi, he insists on the sensible origin of ideas. He even uh, managed to explicitly rehabilitate the peripatetic axiom nil est in intellectu quot prius non fuerit in sensu. And he then develops a sensualist uh, translation of innatism. Innate ideas uh, are such because uh, they are inseparable from the soul and they are not acquired uh, during our life. Uh, they are not innate in the sense that they are independent of the senses. By linking uh, judgment, reason, and spiritual habits uh, to bane traces uh, without mentioning any pure understanding in the system, Regis is thus preparing the ground to the fi his final doctrine in the usage. Uh, I would draw uh, two uh, conclusion. First, the system is often accused of a lack of originality and with a few worthy uh, exceptions is mostly ignored by scholars of 17th century philosophy. Originality is perhaps not the most appropriate category to judge a textbook. Uh, the purpose of a textbook is in fact to present a discipline uh, in the most uh, complete, well-ordered, and up-to-date uh, manner. Uh, to achieve this goal, uh, the author must, uh, above all, select sources and arrange them so that the whole is consistent. The originality is not at the beginning of this process, but it is uh, the result of this work of selection and composition which is never a mere repetition of what others have uh, written. From this point of view, the system is certainly original. Uh, Regis integrates various uh, tendencies of Cartesianism, sometimes associating them with very different philosophers, such as Aristotle and Hobbes. Secondly, uh, if we consider the evolution of uh, Regis' philosophy, we remark that he follows a similar pattern in both his theory of causation and of ideas. In the first case, he starts as a follower of occasional causes and ends up uh, recover an Aristotelian-like efficient causality. In the second, we observe a progressive embodiment of the mind, which culminates in the rehabilitation of Aristotelian nociology. Within these developments, we can spot some trends shared by Regis with some his contemporaries. He gradually diverged from Malbranche's view, as Arnaud uh, does. He rejects uh, pure mind and uh, understanding as the materialistic interpretations of Malbranche circulating in the, in the early um, Enlightenment, uh, 18th century, uh, do. However, it should be pointed out that this evolution is also linked to the variety of the literary forms the chosen by uh, Regis. The system is a textbook in, in which the author's voice is uh, interwined with many others. The usage is a treatise in which the author's personal view uh, is in the spotlight. Uh, 
thank you for your attention and thank you for your passion because uh, I'm not fluent in English and I know that it's very difficult to listen to me for a long time. Thank you very much. Thank you, Antonella, and thank you all for this uh, wonderful session. We have plenty of time for questions, and actually there is a debate already going on on the chat. Um, so maybe we should bring up that debate on the surface first and ask Dennis to uh, formulate his question and Aaron to reply to that. And sure, I hope it's not too marginal given the the focus has been elsewhere on uh, Regis work, but I want to still ask this. So uh, we heard that uh, Regis uh, political theory is derived from Hobbes uh, and Hobbes political theory derives from the uh, theory of the passions. If you look at the Leviathan's chapter six of the Leviathan and chapters 13 and uh, elsewhere is going to rely on some of the account there. Uh, so uh, in light of this, I want to ask whether Regis presents an extended discussion of the, the passions uh, and whether it's more uh, along the Cartesian lines or along Hobbesian lines. Uh, and uh, if uh, he does uh, go the Cartesian way, how does he derive uh, the, the Hobbesian political uh, theory of the state of nature and the way out of the state of nature uh, given a Cartesian uh, theory of the passions? So I don't want to answer this. And the nice thing about being on a panel is I can just punt this over to someone who can answer it. Um, so I want to pass this to uh, Antonella, who's actually written some on this. Um, she's written about um, Regis' morals and how it relates to the passions. So I wonder if, if you wouldn't mind me punting it over to you, Antonella. Um, I can try to answer. Um, uh, the first question about the passion Yes, uh, Regis uh, uh, speaks about the passion in the third part uh, of uh, his system, in the, in the part of his system uh, devoted to physics. So passion is the last section of physics, not the first section of uh, morals. And his uh, treatment of uh, uh, passion is uh, Cartesian in a very broad sense is uh, because uh, he uh, draw up, he, he pick up uh, uh, Passion de l'âme uh, of Descartes, but also uh, uh, something uh, from uh, Recherche de la Vérité. There are very, um, very deep similarities uh, with the Malbranche treatment of passion. Um, the classification of passion is very similar to Malbranche, more similar to Malbranche than to uh, Descartes. Concerning uh, uh, the politics, um, um, uh, there is a very, uh, very interesting uh, um, paper by um, a, uh, an Italian uh, histor historian of philosophy, uh, Canziani, we translated in French in the in the uh, uh, Silva Maton edition of the first draft of the manuscript of the Morals, uh, which is very detailed about uh, uh, the, the the utilization of uh, Hobbes. Um, Regis, in, in fact, uh, uh, translated sometimes the uh, Cive, uh, Hobbes the Cive, not the Leviathan but uh, the, uh, the Chive, and then escaped to uh, Puffendorf. And uh, uh, in my opinion, but I don't know if uh, I am really uh, right, there is also uh, some similarities to, um, to Nicole's um, theory of uh, um, uh, self-love, amour propre. Uh, and this is very interesting because uh, uh, in the in the late seventeenth century uh, there are some similarities and, and some connection in French uh, um, culture uh, between Hobbes and uh, uh, Jansenistic uh, uh, opinion about uh, self love. Um, Hobbes is interpreted uh, as a um, as a, um, a, a way to, uh, to, um, 
to um, to treat about uh, uh, negative passion, uh, negative human passion, such as the self love. I don't know if I, I answered, and I think that Ted could say something more enlightening. <laughs> well, no, I, that was great. Um, and I'm getting this from um, what I read in the volume uh, on the draft of the section on morals. Um, and I forget who said it, maybe you said it, I don't know. But um, it, I had a sense that part of the revision was toning down the egoistical uh, basis for political thought. So toning down the Hobbesian element and emphasizing more love of God being able to play a motivation. I think this um, is connected to um, controversies over Jansenism at the time, because Jansenists, of course, had a very negative view of uh, the, the mot motives for action, uh, including political action. Um, and, um, you know, the Jesuits wanted to say, no, there, there can be um, meritorious motives for action. And I think uh, the Archbishop Arlay probably was pushing Regis away from uh, the more Hobbesian, what looked like a more Jansenist view towards a position that allowed for a pure basis for political, um, for the establishment of the state. Uh, and so, I, yeah, I think that's one way in which Jansenism sort of plays into the revision of the system in the 1680s. We see it in this section on morals. Um, Thank you. Right. So we have a. I think my connection is not entirely reliable at this moment. We have two hands up, uh, Dan and Gideon. I don't know who was first. Um, yeah, Gideon. So this is the first time I think I ever beat Dan into the queue. So <laughs> to be up there first. Uh, so I have a question for each of you and thank you all for your presentations. Um, so let me ask my first question of Aaron. So. In the spirit of creating more trouble and more inconsistencies and more puzzles for the account you wanted to give, you know, in drawing the distinction between soul and mind, I found myself thinking, okay, so if soul is a mode and it, you know, it, it comes into the world when the union is created and it goes out of the world when the union is lost, uh, shouldn't we have to then draw a similar kind of distinction between the human body and then body or something like that? So the human body comes into existence, but when the union is lost, the human body goes out of existence. And then that raises a host of, I almost think, parallel puzzles about the monism, how you individuate bodies, how you individu individuate minds. So I, I, I'd be curious to hear if there's anything like that in the story, or if you think you're compelled to say something like that about the human body. And let me just throw out all my three questions quickly, if, if I could. So for Tad, you know, one of the things that puzzles me about the Cartesian reception and how it develops is that it, it often has a vernacular element. And that's some of the, one of the things you played up here, that educational component. But I wonder about the way in which the vernacular is then reintegrated into the university or into the, the Latin world, right? So in the case of Regi and many others, when we think of the vernacular reception, it's not as though it exists on its own. So I would assume, for example, that the Hobbes that's being read is the Latin Hobbes in the Leviathan. And similarly, in the case of the Neurographia, it's obviously the Latin edition of 84 that, that gets cited here, right? So, the Latin is being utilized to create this vernacular tradition. And I'm curious about the separation we assume exists between the Latin and the vernacular and then the way the vernacular is reintegrated into the universities. So not just into the vernacular community. Okay, and then so for Antonella, my last, my last question, it's about the Neurographia Universalis. So the first edition, if I remember, is the one from 84 that you mentioned, but there are other editions um, and he lives until the early 18th century. I'm curious if there's any shift or acknowledgement of shifts 
in Regis' work as he develops later editions of the neurographia, if anything like that uh, occurs. Thanks, everybody. Sorry. Pretty quick question. Um, so to your first question, uh, I'm not sure I, I see the tension uh, when the mind leaves the body. I don't see any problem with saying it's like not like a human body anymore. It's just a, you know, an earthen machine, what have you. Um, Reiji gives an account where it's very similar to Descartes. Once the blood starts flowing in a fetus, um, once the body is ready to receive a soul, the soul sort of joins to it. And then it becomes like a full formed or like a fully like human rational animal or whatnot. But then when it leaves, I, yeah, I see no problem just saying like, there is no human body anymore. There's just a lump of stuff um, because he's doing the same things that Descartes thinks that bodies are only differentiated by uh, side shape and motion, et cetera, et cetera. Did I answer your question or did I just avoid it? Well, I, I think there's a tension in Descartes there too, right? So what individuates the human body is the, the soul, it would seem. It's yeah. not just, right? So if you want to accept that there's something lost, then I think then, then now there are puzzles to me about what individuates bodies. Is it just motion? Is that enough? Or is there just this monistic, unchanging substance that is corporeal substance? But I, I won't press the point. I mean, that's yeah. a, there's a, certainly an answer, but it's not your fault that the, the Cartesian system doesn't necessarily yeah, I get what you're saying. Um, the only thing I could gesture to is he seems to indicate that it's a particular type of motion that makes the body su particularly susceptible to taking on a, um, a soul. But this, these are like vacuous explanations that don't really, don't really do anything, in my opinion. Could I just add something to that? Because uh, huh? I do think there's something like a monism where you have the one indefectible uh, atemporal uh, material substance. Yeah. And then, so what gets individuated are the modes. So you don't have a problem with individuation of substances. You know, right. Hershey's, that's a difference. Um, now, how you, I don't know that he gives you a very complete account of how you get the modal individuation. Um, but, but I do think there is something like that, that. The problem is no longer, as in Descartes, I think, individuating distinct material substances, but rather in individuating uh, modes of the one substance. But that's not entirely uncontroversial reading, but I think that's what's going on. Um, yeah, maybe here what... it's a moment to address Steve's question. Steven Nadler has asked a question on the chat. Um, if you want to have a look at it. So I'm reading it. If, it's for Aaron. If the soul is necessary apart only of a union with the body, is it not the notion of a disembodied soul as, yeah. a, as opposed to a embodied mind, an oxymoron? Yeah. So um, I actually responded to uh, Stephen in, in a chat, but um, just for the rest of everyone, I cited uh, a passage where he actually refers to the, a disembodied soul. But I think this is one of these passages where he's being particularly loose with his language. Um, he's really consistent until it gets to something wildly controversial, like talking about the soul dying after death. And so he'll say things like, yeah, a disembodied soul can exist, but then he goes on to qualify in subsequent passages that he's really meaning just a mind. He's just sort of adopting the term there. I think to calm people down a little bit, because if you said the soul is not immortal, like flat out, um, that would probably get you into trouble. Uh, so he'll say the soul is immortal in a sense, um, that senses that the mind is immortal. Um, so he's, there's a few portions of his text where he's loose with the language, um, but you can tell he's being loose, I think broadly for political reasons. Uh, so you, uh, should I go on to the question two mm. <laughs> about the vernacular? Yeah, yes, please. Okay. Um, yeah, so I mean, one question is, did, well, a couple questions, did, Regis intend this to be used as a university textbook. And what I was arguing at the end is no uh, indication that he wasn't. It was a sort of popular work. Um, now that is consistent with it having sort of an indirect effect on university teaching. So if students are exposed to this attractive new view, they'll want their teachers to teach it. And I think there were such pressures at University of Paris. 
and there were reactions against it, which is the campaign in the 1690s against Cartesianism, I think it is connected to that. But I would want to emphasize that it didn't have a direct influence in the sense that it was actually used or mentioned in the classroom, in the universities. And here in the longer presentation, um, uh, longer paper that presentation is taken from, I contrast uh, the system in this respect with a textbook that was associated with Cartesianism at the University of Paris, that's uh, Porchot's uh, Institutio Philosophica of 1695, based on earlier lectures, where Descartes is never mentioned, <laughs> prudently enough, uh, and um, it is written in Latin for textbook use and based on lectures. And that work uh, I argued in the longer paper was involved, was directly involved in controversies over Cartesianism within the university. And so there's a clear contrast as far as influence goes uh, between these two texts. Both were associated with Cartesianism, Regis because he overtly stated that there was a connection for show because it was obvious that certain aspects connected his views to Cartesian views. Um, but as far as what had a direct effect on the, what was actually done in the university, I think it's Porchot's text rather than Regis's that had that sort of influence. So I'll pass the baton to Antonella, I think, <laughs> for the third question. Um. I have no ans uh, no no answer because I I just studied the, the um, uh, 1684 edition of Neurographia uh, in order to compare it with the system, but I didn't I didn't study uh, all the other edition of, of uh, Neurographia. Um, I can say that the second edition in 1685 is quite similar to the first edition, but, but it's just the only thing I can say. I'm sorry. Thank you, Dan, Dan Garber. Um, thank you all for a very, very interesting uh, session. Um, my, um, the main question it is that I wanted to ask is actually one that, um, is closely connected uh, with a question that Gideon raised, uh, which is um, about um, the influence of um, Regi within the university. And I think what I was gonna point out, is very similar to what um, Tad was pointing out, which is that the uh, Regi, that Descartes' so-called textbook, the Principia Philosophiae, which was intended to be used in the university. Um, in that respect, is very different from what Regi was doing. But I think it's also worth pointing out that um, one of the really interesting things about the difference between um, the sort of intellectual climate, say in the 1640s, when Descartes is writing the Principia, and um, later in the 1680s and 90s, when we're talking about regime, is the fact that at that point, there is a very extensive Cartesian culture that, exi that exists outside the, the uh, university, um, in good part, you know, because of you know, people like Huo, who had made Cartesianism uh, something that was of interest to a much wider public. Um, and this, I think, you know, the fact that um, some of these works are in Latin doesn't necessarily mean that they're intended for a university audience, as opposed to people who may at one point or another have studied in the university. Um, because the Latin would have been um, um, available to them. But that's just sort of an observation. But let me put on the table something else that I was curious about. Um, I think um, 
can't remember which of you mentioned discussion of the pineal gland. Um, yeah, I did. Pardon? I did. Um, one of the striking things, of course, was um, the, uh, the work of Steno um, and his um, dissection of the brain and his conclusion that it was physiologically impossible for, um, um, for the pineal gland to do what Descartes claimed it did. Um, how did that fit into uh, Regis's um, program? Or did he not notice that? Did he well, not notice that? Uh, yeah, so, um, you know, I think Steno's absolutely crucial step here away from the uh, Cartesian, among the Cartesians. Um, so I, um, I think the influence on uh, Regi is through Gisson, who was influenced by Steno. Uh, so I, I think um, it was widely accepted, even among people like Malbranche, right, that the pineal gland theory was dead. Um, now, in Malbranche's case, he didn't have a successor, but people were searching, Cartesians were searching, who had given up on the pineal gland uh, because of Steno, largely. Um, were searching for an alternative and Buisson gave Regis something to work with. The white matter, the, the central oval, was the new successor to the pineal gland. Uh, and so I, I think Regis realized the pineal gland theory was a non-starter by that point. Uh, need an al alternative, he searched for one, saw it in Buisson, and that sort of is what we get in the system. So I think that's the timeline. Just to Thank add you. on to that a little, little bit, um, I, you can correct me if I'm wrong, Ted. Um, I think he barely even mentions the pineal gland. Um, I think he mentions it once and then just doesn't even talk about it anymore. Um, and then just goes on to develop his own theory. So he never like tries to address the objections that Steno brought up, but he seems to be sort of assuming them in the development of his theory. Yeah, by then it was dead letter. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Nobody yeah. accepted it really. Um, and, uh, you know, Regius was a great defender, but he had died by that point. And, and there was no real defender of the pineal gland by that point. And Thomas Willis is a pretty big influence at this yeah. point, too, maybe even more what? than Steno on, um, on the neurographia, I think. Um, okay. One can, but, it, it seems to me that one can still be a Cartesian, even if you give up the pineal gland. There can still be, you know, a project of finding where it is yep. that the mind is connected to the body. Right. So that was sort of the assumption that remained, that there was a sort of locus of interaction in the brain. Right. And the question is where Steno Willis showed that, well, it can't be the pineal gland for anatomical reasons. Uh, so there was a kind of search for an alternative to that. And what's interesting is, I mean, it might seem possible, well, there's no one locus that acts here, it acts there, could act in different places, but that was assumed to be, that's, that's not where we start. We start with, there's a central point, we just, or central area, and we just got to find out what that is. And central of all was what was winning out among Cartesians about, at the time uh, the C-STEM was published. But an important follow-up is that it's the centrum semi-ovale is not a central point. It actually has parts. Um, it has right. movement in it. Um, yeah, yeah. So, so he is moving away from some of the, the basic requirements that Descartes laid out. Yeah. yeah. Well, the pineal uh, gland, yeah, yeah. insofar as it's extended, has parts. Yeah, yeah but there is the argument it's yeah. indivisible in a sense. <laughs> yeah, in a sense. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe because it doesn't have different, uh, functionally differential, uh, differentiated mm -hmm. parts. Yeah. Uh, the central oval does, that's true. Um, but it's still still a place. I mean, it isn't as if they're uh, right. discontinuous parts of the brain. On yeah, the and, and it's not the entire body as well, which is what he not wants. The entire body. Yeah. And but it's essential, it's essential for Descartes that the pineal gland be movable. Right. Um, because that's what opens and closes the valves and the uh, yeah. 
that allows the animal spirits to circulate. Yeah, and that's the one point Stenna says going back to Galen, <laughs> that it happen. doesn't do that. It can't move, can't so happen. yeah. And yeah, so that was already in Galen, the rejection of that view that um, the pineal gland can open and close valves. Um, but Descartes sort of revived that view. Uh, and then it was rejected Steno by Stenonios and others. Yeah. And so I'll have to find something else, some other command central. Or... And we're still looking. <laughs> That's right. Although, I mean, it might be if the mind is module, modular, that it, there is no one central place. There are several places. Um, but that was just assumed not to be the case. Laforge may be the last of the great defenders of the pineal gland. Yep, yep, he is. Yeah. Um, and he responded to Steno. Uh, I think the responses are very weak. That's my impression. Um, but he does have explicit responses. And Steno and Laforge actually interacted at Somer. Um, and I think 1665, he went to visit Laforge, Steno did. So they actually had interactions on this issue. And before the lecture, Steno's lecture notes were published, um, uh, LaForge is already responding to it, but not just Steno by name, but the position is responding already. Right, uh, we have two more minutes and a small question on the chat by Adi Fal. Adi, if you can make it short, and I wonder whether the response can be short. Yes, thank you. I will just um, I will just read perhaps the question. Um, uh, you've mentioned all of you that in the system regis has a part on method. Uh, could you enlarge a bit uh, regarding this point and whether, in your view, this part in regis is Cartesian or not? Uh, maybe I'll start because I mentioned that first. Um, so it is Cartesian. I think the least Cartesian part is the part on reasoning where we get the rules of the syllogism and all that, um, that Descartes wanted to get rid of. Um, but the part on method, my sense is, and uh, uh, Aaron or uh, Antonella can correct me if I'm wrong here, but that does seem quite Cartesian, focus on clear and distinct ideas. I recall that there was a recapitulation, basic recapitulation of the rules. So in that respect, it's very Cartesian part of the section on logic. Yeah, and this is also the section where he's pulling a lot on um, Arno and Nicole. Um, so if they're Cartesian, I think then Regi is Cartesian as well. <laughs> I put it like that. Good, this is a good closing uh, phrase for our seminar tonight. Thank you all for uh, your talks and thank you all for the discussion. Next week, we are going to talk about artisanal practices in early modern mathematics. So see you next week. Thanks, everyone.